So far, there have only been two expansions which have printed multi-class cards. Those being Mean Streets of Gadgetzan, which introduced tri-class cards, and Skolomance Academy, which introduced bi-class cards. And in this list, we'll be going over the best multi-class cards that have ever been printed over the years. And at number 10, we have Demon Companion. This is a one-mana multi-class spell which is available for demon hunters and hunters, as indicated by the half-dark green and half-light green border around the card, and summons one of three possible demon companions. One of them is Kolek, which is an anagram of Leok, which is a 1-2 demon which gives your other minions plus one attack while it's on the field. The other is Refa, which is a 2-1 demon which can attack an enemy immediately, and is an anagram of Huffer. And the last is Shima, a 2-2 demon with taunt which is modeled after Misha. This card is just insanely efficient no matter which demon companion you manage to summon. Not only are there no other collectible one drops with their insane stats and effects, they also have half of the stats of the animal companions, which have long been considered to be great minions, while costing three times less. And while sometimes you'd wish you'd gotten a different companion for your exact situation, it's really not a stretch to say that all three of them would be played in almost every aggro deck if they were collectible. Some notable interactions that this card has is while Ruffa can deal direct face damage for lethal, Kolek can potentially do more damage or give you favorable trades if you have minions on the board. Or if you just want to build a board, the overstatted Shima is great for pushing damage or protecting your other cheap units. No matter how you slice it, the worst case is that you get a companion that you don't want, while the right one could potentially be game winning, all for just one mana. And because of the high roll potential, pretty much every aggressive tempo or mid-range hunter and Demon Hunter has wanted to include this card in their decks. While this card has seen a very generous amount of competitive play since it was printed, most notably in odd Demon Hunter decks in Wild and Face Hunter decks in Standard, the rest of this list is filled with absolutely monstrous cards. That isn't to say Demon Companion is bad at all, in fact it could easily find itself in the top 10 of most other lists. It's just that all the other multi-class cards in this list have been way more degenerate at one point, or seen more play than Demon Companion has. And at number 9, we have Adorable Infestation. This 1 mana hunter and druid card gives a minion plus 1 plus 1 and summons a 1-1 one, one beast onto the field and adds another 1-1 one, one beast to your hand. This card was designed to be a 1 mana version of Ultimate Infestation, probably the most efficient 10 mana card ever printed, and proved to be just as good. All of the effects combined should arguably cost anywhere from 1.5 to 2 mana, meaning you're pretty much gaining a mana advantage for just playing it. And although Adorable Infestation doesn't fit in the same deck as its predecessor, it did find the same, if not more, competitive success in aggro spell hunters, beast druids, and token druids. And because it had so many effects stapled together, pretty much every deck in hunter and druid could find a way to squeeze it in and have it synergize with another card in their deck. In standard, Adorable Infestation was used a great effect with Kolkar Pack Runner, which could buff the swift hyenas it spawned as well as swarm the board with more 1-1s. One -ones. Druids use this card to make both their Umbral Owls and Frost Saber Matrix cost less for each spell and beast you summon, respectively. Infestation lets you double dip and let Druid be able to drop these threats as early as turn 5. But by far the best use of this card was in Token Druid, which as the name implied, tried to summon and beat their opponent down with a swarm of small minions. Infestation was once again a perfect match for this deck, which wanted to buff its early game minions while summoning as many minions as possible in order to buff them all with Mark of the Lotus and Savage Roar. And just like the previous card on this list, this card actually made it to the number 5 spot in one of our other lists, proving just how powerful the rest of those cards on this list are. And at number 8, we have Jandis Barath. This 5 mana 2 1 mage and rogue minion summons 2 random 5 mana minions and makes you secretly pick one that dies whenever it takes damage. And at first glance, you may wonder how this card is even on this list, especially since you're basically paying for a random 5 drop since the other one can die to 1 damage. But because Jandis creates three bodies and forces your opponent to decide which of the two random five drops is the real one, since they can't actually see the choice you made, it actually is a pretty complex card and could potentially bait out a lot of resources from your opponent. For example, in a pretty average case, if Jandis were to randomly summon an Ethereal Conjurer and a Dragon Consort, nine out of ten times you would pick the Ethereal Conjurer to die to any damage effectively giving you a 13-7 for just 5 mana. Of course, two of the minions could be easily cleared, but even in Wild, those are insane stats for just one card. So in those 9 out of 10 times, your opponent will typically just deal 1 damage to the lower health minion and move on. But, the mind game really begins when sometimes you unexpectedly pick the bigger minion, making your opponent waste a 1 damage on your still alive Ethereal Conjurer, while still having to deal with the Dragon Consort. At higher levels of play, the mind games go way deeper, forcing your opponent to deal damage to the obvious choice and potentially wasting resources, or to the worst choice and potentially taking a ton of damage. 
and even though it had the chance to completely whiff, it also had the chance to psych your opponent out or waste enough of the resources to turn a game around. You could play here when you were ahead, fighting for board, behind, or even trying to fish for lethal. And for all these reasons, she saw a ton of play in Odd Rogue, Reno Mage, and in pretty much every Rogue and Mage and Standard until she got nerfed to 6 mana and rotated out. And at number 7, we have Aya Blackpaw, the leader of the Jade Lotus. This 6 mana 5-3 can only be played in the Jade Lotus classes, which are Shaman, Druid, and Rogue. When Aya is played and dies, she summons a Jade Golem. A mechanic which summons a minion with stats equal to the number of Jade Golems you'd summon that game. So, for example, if you had summoned 3 Jade Golems previously, Aya will summon a 4-4 Jade Golem when played and a 5-5 Jade Golem when she dies, basically tying her power level to the number of Jade Golems you were able to summon by then. Each class was given 2-3 unique ways to summon Jade Golems, Aya and Jade Spirit, meaning if you played every Jade card in your deck, you could potentially summon a 9-9 and a 10-10 with Aya, which is easily enough to win a game. Although pure Jade Shaman and Jade Rogues never took off, she did see staple play in Jade Druid and Odd Shaman as a sticky finisher. For a decent amount of time, Jade Druid was one of the best decks in both formats, due to having access to some of the best card draw, mana ramp, and stalling cards in the game, eventually winning by being able to summon and shuffle infinite copies of Jade Idol. And as you would expect, Jade Druid was easily able to clear 12 Jade Idol summons a game making a late-game Aya a devastating threat. On the other hand, Odd Shaman was another deck which used a small Jade package made up of Jade Claws, Jade Lightning, and Aya since they were good enough standalone cards to be competitive. Because even if you weren't able to summon any Jade Golems at game, which honestly was kind of rare, Aya was still a 6-mana 8-6 worth of stats, and easily enough to help finish out games as an aggro deck. And speaking of cards which fit into aggro decks... And at number 6, we have Nitro Boost Poison. This 1-mana rogue and warrior spell lets you give a minion plus to attack, but if you had played a card that was more expensive than it while it was in your hand, it also gives your weapon a plus 2 attack. While this card saw some experimentation in warrior, there were never enough good weapons to justify running nitro boost. Rogue, on the other hand, absolutely loved this card and abused it in as many decks as possible. Have you ever wondered why nearly all of the weapon buff cards in rogue are either bad or have been nerfed at some point? Well, that's because King Banes exists and is the bane of Team 5 the Hearthstone development team. King's Bane is a 1-mana one 1-3 one, weapon which, when broken, reshovels itself back into your deck and permanently keeps any buffs applied to it. Simply put, when every weapon buff is balanced around only being able to use a weapon a set number of times, it makes a card like King's Bane's, which basically has infinite durability, potentially very broken. And with the introduction of Nitro Boost Poison, yet another good weapon buffing card, this was the card that broke the camel's back. And with at least 5 other ways to buff King's Bane, and access to a ton of draw, it was almost trivial making getting your infinite durability King's Bane to have 10 or more attack. Odd Rogue also loved this spell since it could easily be corrupted and deal 6 damage with their hero power for just 1 mana. It was effectively a 1 mana fireball in most rogue decks, and unfortunately it had to get nerfed. With the nerf to 2 mana it meant that it could no longer be played in Odd Rogue, since it now had an even mana cost, and was much, much harder to corrupt in King's Bane Road since a ton of their cards cost 2 or less mana. And at number 5, we have Potion of Illusion. This 4-mana Mage and Rogue spell adds 1-mana one 1-1 one, one copies of all your friendly minions on board to your hand. And for those of you who would expect this card to be a bad deal most of the time, you'd be right. That's because if you want the maximum value for this card, you need to have a full board of 7 minions, and have enough space to hold 7 1-1 one, one minions in your hand. So, which decks was this card actually good in? The answer is any deck that really, really wanted extra copies of the cornerstone minions that their decks were built around. While Potion was played in Reno Mages to copy their high value minions, the reason it's on this list is because of its insane burst potential in combo decks. The first of these decks was Exodia Mage, which utilized the Mage Quest reward Time Warp, which lets you take an extra turn. On the combo turn, you would have to somehow manage to get four Sorceress Apprentices on the board, play Time Warp, play Archmage Antonidas, and a spell, at which point you would have access to infinite zero mana fireballs. Crucial to this combo was being able to get four apprentices, but since you could only include two per deck, cards like Molten Reflection and Potion were critical for getting enough extra apprentices. Exodia decks would eventually start using Flame Waker instead for their burst damage, but drop Potion in favor of Molten Reflections. In Rogue, however, Pillager Rogue was at one point the best deck in Wild, which is no easy feat at all. The new combo revolved around Spectral Pillager, which dealt damage equal to the number of cards that you had played that turn. And with the help of Spirit of the Shark, which doubled your combo effects, Scabs, which offered a ton of discounts, various cheap cards, and Potion, this deck was easily able to deal more than 50 damage. 
And what's really funny is that the potion could just add 1-1 one, one copies of your entire combo back to your hand if you messed up. Or if you needed 1 mana 1-1 one, one versions of your critical minions to make the combo even cheaper and deadlier. The only thing holding this card back from being higher in this list is how hard Pillager Rogue is to pilot optimally despite consistently being tier 1 at some of the most powerful times in Wild. And at number 4, we have Hysteria. This 3-mana Priest and Warlock spell lets you choose a minion and force it to attack another minion until it dies. Hysteria was originally printed to act as a creative form of removal, either by forcing one of your enemy minions to attack until it died, or by targeting a big minion on either side to attack and clear other minions on the field. And for just 3 mana, it could often go 1 for 1, which is still a great deal when compared to other removal. Other than being really good removal, Hysteria also found itself in one of Wild's many S-tier decks that got quickly nerfed after being released. Basically, all you have to do for the combo turn is play Wretched Tiller, a 1-mana one 1-1, one, which deals 2 damage to the enemy hero every time it attacks. Deathspeaker, a 3-2-4 mana minion, which made another minion immune for that turn, and Hysteria on that tiller. And if there was at least 15 minion health on board, which included the 4 from your Deathspeaker, the Immortal Tiller would attack 15 times because of Hysteria and let you kill your opponent in one turn. But if your opponent were to realize this, you can always play Shrinkmeister on your Tiller, a 2 mana 3 2 that gave a minion minus 2 attack for the turn, letting your 0 attack immune Tiller attack an infinite number of times for an infinite amount of damage. And by infinite, I mean it would only deal 60, because Hearthstone has infinite loops hard coded to only repeat 30 times. This combo was obviously nerfed since a 7 mana 3 card combo with almost no counterplay made it by far the best deck at the time. And remember how I mentioned how good it was as removal? Well, it was still so good in its intended use that it received another nerf later, this time increasing its mana cost to 4. And at number 3, we have Lightning Bloom. This 0 mana druid and shaman spell lets you gain 2 mana crystals for the turn only, and overloads you by 2, a keyword which makes you have much less mana on your next turn. So, sure, this card basically gives you 2 mana this turn at the cost of taking 2 mana from your next turn, but why is it so high on this list? Well, it's because most of the time when you're playing Lightning Bloom, your play is so strong that it doesn't matter that you have 2 less mana on your next turn. And despite being a strictly worse Innervate, at least it's a nerfed version of one of the best cards of all time. For these reasons, Lightning Bloom has seen near universal inclusion in Shaman and Druid over the past 2 years. One of the most notable decks Bloom's been included in is Celestial Alignment Druid, which, as the name implies, basically aimed to turbo out their namesake card, which cost 7 mana and set both players' mana to 1, and made all cards cost 1 mana. It also lets you play another minion post-alignment, since even though it would only cost 1 mana, it would still give you 2 mana to play with. Or in Wild, with the introduction of Bloom, Avionicun, decks got a lot better, since they could now run a consistently better nerfed Innervate in their decks. The Druid combo would involve playing Aviana, a 10 mana minion which made all your other minions cost 1 mana, Lightning Bloom, and Kun, which would restore all your mana, letting you play up to 10 more minions that turn. Some decks opted to use a super beefed up Cthulhu and Togwago combo, a Maligo spell deck, or even a Star Aligner OTK to finish off their opponent. Even Shaman got in on the OTK party, building an impressively strong Fireheart deck, revolving around playing as many direct damaging spells as possible in a single turn which Lightning Bloom helped by giving more mana on the combo turn. Even some aggro decks started to run Lightning Bloom for its mana burst potential. And speaking of staple cards that have been played ever since it's released, and at number 2 we have Kazakus. This 4 mana 3-3 three three is the leader of the Cabal and can only be played in Mage, Priest, and Warlock. When played, if your deck has no duplicates in it, he lets you create a custom potion which can cost 1, 5, or 10 mana, and lets you choose 2 effects from a pool of 10 options. And the way Hearthstone is designed is so that you'll only be able to see three options, like a Discover, whenever you pick your potion effects, making the chance you're able to select a specific potion effect a little more than 50%. And honestly, most of them are pretty good. And the good ones are really good. Some of the best 5 mana ones let you deal 4 damage to all minions, deal 5 damage, or resurrect 2 friendly minions that had died that game. Now, the only part of this card that might be of some slight concern is Kazakus' poor stats and condition for creating a custom potion. Luckily, Reno decks were already very popular, and they built their decks around not having any duplicates just so they could play Reno Jackson for his amazing full health effect. Kazak is perfectly fit into Reno decks, which have been pretty much always good and had their place in the meta, even in Wild. Again, there are almost too many variants of Reno Mage, Reno Priest, and Reno Warlock to name, and all three of these classes at one point had Tier 1 Reno decks. Reno Mage, at one point, used a pre-nerfed Luna's Pocket Galaxy to make all minions in the deck cost 1. Reno Priest used Raza, Anduin, and a ton of Psycho cards to burst down their opponent with a machine gun of hero powers. Reno Warlock used Voidcaller, Big Demons, and their insane amount of card draw to easily win games. 
And in all of these decks, Kazakis was the glue that made all of these decks consistent and powerful. Kazakis has always been powerful and in the meta, and if it weren't for the next card on this list, this Dragon Troll could have definitely been the number one. And at number one, we have Flesh Giant. This 8 mana 8-8 eight, eight giant available for Priest and Warlocks cost 1 mana less each time your hero's health changes on your turn. And for as seemingly simple and difficult a condition is to get off, it is actually the easiest giant in the game to get to 0 mana. You see, more so in Warlock than in Priest, both classes have ways to restore and deal damage to their hero, which can both cause Flesh Giant to cost less. This card immediately started seeing play in Dark Lair Warlock, a deck which revolved around taking damage to cheat out a ton of mana. Molten Giant and Flesh Giant really helped to solidify this deck as an S tier one, since you could so easily drop at least two of them by turn four. And after Dark Lair got absolutely busted, Flesh Giant, with the help of pretty much the whole Dark Lair package, found themselves in Questline Warlock, undoubtedly one of the most broken cards of all time, and one of two cards that have ever been straight up banned in Wild. Basically, all you had to do was just take a ton of damage, play the quest reward Blightborn Tasman, which made any damage you take redirect your opponent, and kill them with either fatigue or with your other self-damaging cards. And if this plan didn't work out, or if you got too low, you could always rely on your giants to pack the game up for you instead. And an honorable mention goes out to Raise Dead, another multi-class card which was almost always played with Flesh Giant, and another broken card. I've decided to give Flesh Giant the number one spot instead, because not only has it been nerfed twice, whereas Raise Dead hasn't been touched at all, it was also the main reason why Dark Lair decks are able to output so much damage so early into games. And since I didn't want to talk about basically the same deck in the number two spot, I've included it here at the number one spot with Flesh Giant. No other card in the game has allowed any deck to easily get a zero mana 8-8 and ultimately warp the meta around trying to counter Questline and Dark Lair Warlock. And for those reasons, Flesh Giant definitely deserves a number one spot on this list. All right, and that's the list. If you think we missed any other cards that should have definitely been on this list, or have ideas for future videos just like this one, let us know down in the comments.